Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Carmine's Arena, a cultural gourmet of information, if you will, a feast for your mind and soul. And now, without further delay, the man, the myth, the maestro, Carmine Arena. Hello, and welcome again to Carmine's Arena, site of contest and conflict, venue for and of resolution. Resolution in terms of focus, remedy, and commitment, both yours and mine, to keeping faith with Western civilization. It has been noted that we don't stop laughing because we've grown old. We get old because we've stopped laughing, particularly at ourselves. Um, this brings us to the uh, subject, which is perspective, yours and mine, which we hold on to dearly. Instead of holding on to them and sharing them with a certain degree of grace and levity. I come by uh, this uh, insight uh, rather fortuitously, for I come from two traditions, uh, Italian, Catholic, and uh, American Jewish. My father having come from Naples and my mother born in Brooklyn of uh, Austrian and Russian Jewish parents. And all of my young days and into my adulthood for my mother and father lived with one another before they departed this earth for 65 years. And I was always amused by the different perspectives that they had uh, um, as against the same stimulus. Uh, the Italian in my father regarded uh, <laughs> uh, government as a tiresome abstraction. Uh, like most Italians, his commitment, his focus, and all of his remedies were given over to the energies involved with family and with food, friends, and amore. Government, why Italy has had 86 since the end of World War II. That's with what indifference uh, they all share towards this uh, strange abstraction. On the other hand, my mother uh, regarded uh, government uh, with tremendous suspicion and regarded it as a necessary evil, uh, for an evil it has been for uh, throughout Jewish history that needn't be reviewed. Uh, the thing is, however, that one regarded politics and anything attendant on it as positively ridiculous, and the other wanted to have some handle on it, and uh, the two, as I say, always had these varying perspectives. So that today, I still consider myself, given that heritage, as a work in progress. I am not particularly uh, married to any particular uh, uh, perspective that I think is carved in stone. And I wish that on you. Uh, my mother was fond of saying, if you put two Jews in a room together, you immediately have an argument that splits hairs to a nettlesome degree. If one leaves and the other is left alone, uh, the tendency is to argue with God. In fact, uh, the word Israel, for Jacob was renamed Israel, read it uh, in the Old Testament, and you will see that it literally means wrestling with God or the angel of God, literally rest, wrestling with the divine. Uh, a, uh, an Israeli friend of mine who's become an American citizen said, now, on the other hand, if you leave uh, a Jew alone, he'll form two opposing parties. I attend uh, to uh, favor that kind of flexibility. Now, Circumstances have a tendency, no matter what our perspectives, of messing with our groove. 
<laughs> and I'm about to mess with your groove tonight. At least if I succeed, I will be doing that. Uh, for reality always trumps opinion. That's a, a, um, a truism. It hones our validity and it refines our focus. The only time you run into a, um, a reality uh, that doesn't bend no matter what, you are now dealing with fanaticism, which has always had its own reality and is in a perennial state of uh, what? Denial. Yes, denial. Uh, you take Islamic fascism that is born of fundamentalism that has nothing whatsoever to do with Islamic orthodoxy. It has all to do with this political way of thinking. And because of that, uh, it uh, is now uh, involved in 50 wars throughout the globe. Count them, 5 0 50. It issues edicts and fatahs to silence artists and anyone else who uh, wants to defy their reasoning. And uh, as a result, uh, Islam uh, has been overtaken by murderers, headhunters, uh, bombers, and suicide raiders. Where are the moderates? I only hear them when I hear that they want foot baths in America so as to prepare themselves for prayer. And I, uh, I hear them talk about um, uh, profiling. But after that, they seem to be gagged, either from uh, suffering from fatigue or fear. Uh, they remind me of uh, that wonderful image uh, in that painting of uh, Edvard Munch, the Norwegian, who uh, you might remember, the images of one screaming. I've always thought to myself, though it's there silently, I hear that scream. And it's in keeping with uh, Karl Buchner, a 19th century uh, uh, play playwright, uh, who whose brother, this is simply an aside that comes to mind, uh, came to America, became a citizen, and was the first to design the teddy bear. Well, uh, uh, Carl, uh, the playwright, uh, died at a very young age and wrote some, uh, well, one in particular, Wozzeck, uh, which is constantly being performed, and an opera uh, was based on it. He said the following, how can you not hear the terrible screams all around us that we call silence? Well, I'm afraid my music training has allowed me to hear it and it causes me tremendous sadness. I hear those screams coming from many sources throughout the world. And no matter what my perspective, I continue to hear them wondering when all of us are going to be tuned in or tuned up. Now, if you're thinking of a tin ear, one has to think no further than academia. They have their own groove and they don't like it messed with because if you mess with it, you're in fear of uh, harming your grades as a student and you're accused of not being collegial. In other words, academia today is busy indoctrinating rather than educating. Uh, you look at their catalog and you see agenda studies, which means feminism. And feminism, of course, is the antimatter of femininity. And when women lose their femininity, they lose the grace, style, and the, uh, and the power of being women. And as long as there are no women around, males will be a thing of beauty and boys forever. They'll never grow into men if women don't demand it. Of course, the demand that feminists make is petulant and is usually ignored. Uh, race and class studies is another thing that they enjoy teaching. Uh, I should say indoctrinating their students uh, thereby. Uh, race and class studies, what has it done? It has caused enormous polarity. It has caused people to become professional race baiters, baiters and um, people who are 
perennially in an ethnocentric frenzy. Then you take postmodernism, which is the deconstruction of meaning itself until meaning is considered meaningless. There is no such thing as meaning. As a result, the great books, the great uh, canon of literature of Western civilization is now called, are you ready for this, the history of dead white men. Can you imagine the history of dead white men? Think of that rasta of genius from every single corner of, of uh, Western civilization. And to think of it in those terms is a kind of arrogance that is unimaginable, except that they try to balance it by saying that the, the dead white man, man's history is one of repression and exploitation. That's all they see. And as a result, they gather around them this precious sense of self-loathing. Oh, they simply adore hating themselves and hating America. Now, precocity, the precocious, have been shown over and over again throughout history, both recent and past, to be socially naive. Now, this is not only uh, our uh, particular problem. I am aware of it uh, most uh, poignantly when it is, but I must admit that this self-loathing that comes from the academic indoctrination and uh, the, the um, uh, hammering away and droning about the most negative things in any country's history uh, the Germans have summed up in a marvelous eight-syllable uh, word, uh, one of those great collective nouns that's a chain of other nouns. It's called Vergangenheit Beweltligung. It sounds like a disease, and certainly uh, it is, coming to terms with one's past history. You know, I, I find it... Um, uh, enjoyable occasionally when encountering someone with strong perspectives who valiantly defend them by lying. In fact, <laughs> paradoxically, I, I prefer the liar because at least they grant me uh, the uh, need to lie because my arguments uh, are apparently are going to be too strong for them uh, to fend off. And so I prefer literally the liar who defends his position by prevaricating. Whereas I am at my wit's end when I'm dealing with someone who feels infinitely honest, you know, the do-gooder who has found his or her groove. They end up being more wishbone than backbone. As a result, when they're alone, they won't form two parties. They don't have the backbone to see another side of the argument. You take, for example, Al Gore and his algorithmic take on global warming. Now, recently I was um, encouraged by an edict uh, that was issued by the English school system. Uh, it declared uh, an inconvenient truth, that movie uh, that Gore made about global warming, as a film that can be shown to children. However, it can only be shown when after it or before it, there is another opinion scientific and meritorious that explain uh, global warming in uh, other terms with other dynamics. They claim that showing the film 
by itself with no kind of follow-up or contradictory opinion is not educating, it's indoctrinating. So there you have a resonance with my thinking echoing precisely what all educational institutions must avoid, and that is indoctrinating. Isn't this what the uh, Islamic fundamentalists are doing with children it grabs hold of in their schools? Grab them when they're young. Hitler knew that, and so does every other dictator, including Mao Zedong, Castro, and the rest of that unholy crew. Now, we come uh, fast forward to something truly topical, for it affects all of us uh, who are interested, even in passing, with money. This economic crisis that we are now faced with. This is a, a time when it becomes ever more uh, evident that Maine and Wall Streets have now crisscrossed over the boulevard of broken dreams. How does this happen? Well, both the rich and the have-nots um, began to think in terms of entitlements. Uh, which, of course, is the core of, I call uh, the, or I should say the core of it all, is greed. This sense of entitlement. The rich felt that they couldn't be rich enough, and the have-nots, which used to be promised, a chicken in every pot, now want a block on every lot, or a lot on every block, uh, take it as you will. And so we had the distribution of uh, wealth given to those who had no intention or wherewithal to pay it back once it was loaned. Uh, we are in a moment I called neo-pragmatic. This neo-pragmatism or practicality is beginning to affect the way people are now talking about um, illegal aliens. We used to call them undocumented. That was another indoctrinating word or phrase. The illegal now, when one uh, recitates on the subject, no longer sounds uh, like it's coming from the field of poetry. It's now coming from the hard uh, facts of priorities and uh, the list of same. For the gimmies and the gotchas who have been plying a route uh, that was on a, uh, an incline uh, over greed and guile have now crashed and ground to a halt. Why do I say this? Well, among other things, Someone sent me this. Uh, it is uh, Wake Up America, it says, a teacher speaks. Now, can you imagine? Uh, I begin not to despair so much of academia when something like this can emerge uh, from it. Hear this. This is a subject close to my heart, this teacher says. Do you know that we have adult students at the school where I teach who are not U.S. citizens and who get the Pell Grant, which is a federal grant, no payback required, plus other federal grants to go to school? One student from the Dominican Republic told me that she didn't want me to find a job for her after she finished my program. Because she was getting housing from our housing department and she was getting the Pell Grant which paid for her total tuition and books plus money left over. 
She was looking into WAIT, W-A-I-T, which gives students a credit card for gas to come to school and to and into CARIBE, C-A-R-I-B-E, an acronym, which is a special program, check it out, I did, for immigrants. And it pays for child care and all sorts of needs while they go to school or training. The one student I just mentioned told me that she was not going to be a U.S. citizen because she plans to return to the Dominican Republic someday and that she loves her country. I asked her if she felt guilty taking what the U.S. is giving her and then not even bothering to become a citizen, and she told me that it doesn't bother her because that is what the money is there for. I asked the Caribe administration about their program, and if you are a U.S. citizen, you don't qualify for the program. And all the while, I am working a full day, my son-in-law works more than 60 hours a week, and everyone in my family works and pays for our education. Something is wrong here. I am sorry, but after hearing they want to sing the national anthem in Spanish, enough is enough. Nowhere that they sing it in Italian, Polish, Celtic, Yiddish, German, or any other language. It was written by Francis Scott Key and should be sung word for word as it was written. The news broadcast even gave the translation. Not even close. Sorry if this offends anyone, but this is my country. Does anyone mind that I love it? If you do not wish to pass on this information, you are part of the problem. And I say bravo or brava, for I don't know whether this teacher is male or female, but it is certainly a refreshing insight, is it not? We used to be an aspiring group. Now we've become expectant of entitlements, rich and poor alike. Uh, my father would call people like this morte de varm, and my, my mother would call them schnurras, which has the overall meaning of grubbers, deadbeats, and leeches. They look for an even playing field. And what we have achieved thereby is a large amount of surface and a loss of depth. When I uh, was a young man and I took out many, many, many mortgages, all of which I satisfied within a period less than the due date. When I appeared at the bank, I was in the presence of inquisitors. They all look like Woodrow Wilson, starched, conservative, and uh, uh, eagle-eyed, wondering if I was looking for a path of least resistance. They wanted to know how much I had saved, how much I had put away uh, for my investment into a house. We had, at that time, a moral compass. Uh, in 1837, my dear friends, there was a collapse much like ours. Banks went out of business in the Northeast in the hundreds. And uh, uh, Emerson wrote his masterpiece uh, called um, Self-Reliance. You should read it, a wonderful essay. Uh, and this is what he had to say a little while after uh, that uh, uh, economic crisis. Who has more obedience than I masters me, though he should not raise his finger. Imagine. He goes on. We fancy it rhetoric when we speak of eminent value. We do not yet see that virtue is height, and that a man or a company of men, plastic and permeable to principle by the law of nature, must overpower and ride all cities, nations, kings, rich men, even poets who are not. Where do we have this pride 
of self-obedience anymore. We talk about a bailout in the billions. Need I remind you that a billion minutes ago, Christ walked the earth, and a billion hours ago, we lived in the Stone Age. And here we are ready to give it away. Were we to give it to all of the citizens, some would use it well. Many would still have precisely what they began with, nothing, nothing. Because circumstance that leads to uh, the crisis of poverty is one thing. When we visit it upon ourself because of our conduct, it is quite something else. The poor have always consoled themselves with extravagance and the rich with economy. Now we want both. We want both from both. We see they want entitlements, expect it. We've lost our moral compass and as a result, we don't distinguish between true north and magnetic north. We suffer from this, another German word, Weltschmerz, this pain of history weighing down on us. It's an excuse, I tell you. Uh, undergraduates, a study showed, half of the undergraduates in America have seriously considered committing suicide at one time or another. This is the joy that academia has fed our student body. You see what I mean? Uh, there was a, a time when the Ten Commandments formed a part of the fabric of our system and uh, were right out there around uh, a courtroom. Now they're no longer to find uh, in any of those precincts. Can you imagine a building filled with lawyers today and judges and politicians wanting to be reminded of not stealing or lying? Why, such a thing would uh, present them and create a hostile work environment. Now, we must redesign ourselves into the Yankee spirit of things. Think of the stage, the sage of Concord, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Read his essay, Self-Reliance, which closes magnificently and which reminds us of why we have the American dream and its consequence, American exceptionalism. He said this, and I quote, I am defeated all the time, but to victory am I born. Until next time, my friends, keep the faith. If you have any comments or other remarks, and that I perhaps could even read on some of these broadcasts, please do not hesitate to write to me, Carmine Arena, P.O. Box 1029, Larchmont, New York, 10538.